This is a fable that was told by Bruce Lee himself to Bob Brimmer, okay? And what I'm going to do in an unusual fashion is I'm actually going to read the koan or the actual fable itself and then we can kind of unpack and unravel what the meaning behind that is, okay? Bob Bremer, Jim Sewell and Tim Tackett became uh, the trio that founded the Wednesday Night Group. And the Wednesday Night Group is the biggest and one of the most authentic um, Jeet Kune schools in the world. If you was learning physics at A-level, let's just say, you're not going to go get advice from somebody who flunked A-level physics because that's just going to be pointless. You're going to go to somebody that's freaking absolutely aced it and gone on to do physics at a higher level even possibly, right? Because they understand it. Welcome to another Martial Mind Power podcast. I'm Jatinder Palha with Sifu Lakloi, and we're going to be dropping some wisdom bombs from the amazing book, The Art of Thinking Without Thinking. Sifu Lakloi, how are you doing this week? Doing very well, thank you. Very well. How about you? Yes, I'm good. Thanks. I'm good. I'm super excited today because uh, we're not going to do a flickety fix. What we're going to do, we're going to use a random generator, <laughs> random number generator to come right. up with a number from the, the range of pages we have on this. And as I hit that, the page that comes up is 304. So let's see if we've done 304 before or not. Nope, we haven't. Oh, awesome. So 304, uh, the woodcutter and the dragon. Ooh. All right. There you go. 304. So. Hmm. What do you think? Interesting. What comes to you? Oh, the woodcutter and the dragon. Oh man, I'm just seeing, I'm just seeing a forest with, with a guy chopping that wood, and he uncovers a dragon in the background. <laughs> That's what's coming up for me today. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Good. Oh, we're kind of uh, on the right lines, but just <laughs> just for the viewers. Um, I'll show the um the picture of this koan, okay. And for the listeners, it's a picture of an axe, okay. It's got a dark kind of almost looks like a a black steel blade with a red axe handle, right? And the axe is um been um been um worn out a bit. Yeah, it's a bit worn out. It's a you know, it's, it's certainly been used, and it's uh, stuck in a, or just been left stuck in a, a, in a log. Okay, mm. so that's the image that we're looking at. All right, so somebody chopping down wood in the woods, and a dragon appears, and covered a dragon staring at him, almost like. I know I'm getting I'm getting this reflection thing. So the dragons come up. The guy's thinking, "Oh my goodness, what's this?" And his life flashes before his eyes. <laughs> is this dragon gonna eat him or something, or is there gonna be some deep insights that come from the dragon? That's what's coming up for me today. That's interesting. Usually, it's like I'm just I'm, I'm a pitch. It's pictures coming in my mind today. Good. Well, you know what? Your picture is actually quite close, and this this section or this koan actually is uh the the title of this is inspired by um a story that was told to me by one of my most senior sifus uh sifu tim Tuckett. uh and he's also actually um um got an extract of this uh story in his book essential jeet Kune Do. Mm -hmm. and <clears throat> originally this is a fable that was told by Bruce Lee himself to Bob Bremer. Okay. And what I'm going to do in an unusual fashion is I'm actually going to read the koan or the actual fable itself. And then we can kind of unpack and unravel what the meaning behind that is. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So here we go. So oh, once upon a time, there was an old Chinese woodcutter. He was very poor. 
Every day, he went out to the forest, hoping to chop enough wood to sell in town to make enough money to buy rice to feed his family. One day, when he was deep in the forest cutting down a tree with his trusty axe, he heard a giant roar from behind on the other side of the clearing. He heard the roar again and he saw the trees were shaking as if there was a huge windstorm. Since the wind was calm where he was, he couldn't figure out what was happening on the other side of the clearing. He soon found out because a huge dragon suddenly appeared. The woodcutter immediately thought to himself, if I could kill this dragon, I could sell it for so much money that I could feed my family for the rest of my life and never have to cut wood again. The woodcutter grabbed his axe and took a step towards the dragon. The dragon then raised a claw with huge talons on it and said, hold it right there, you SOB. I know what you want to do. You want to kill me with the axe so you can sell my body for a lot of money. Well, I'm telling you that if you take one more step, I'll blow my fiery breath on you and burn you to a cinder. The woodcutter figured that it was no use to try and kill the dragon, so he turned back to chopping the tree down. The second time he went to chop the tree, the axe slipped out of his hand and hit the dragon right between the eyes, killing him. End of story. Oh. <laughs> Wait, listen, that lost me again, right? So the woodcutter figured there was no use trying to kill the dragon. So he turned back to chopping the tree. And uh, the second time he went to chop the tree, the axe slipped out of his hands and hit the dragon right between the eyes, killing him. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> mm, that's um, a very interesting one. Okay. Very interesting. <laughs> so, so what do you think? What do you think it's trying to tell us? Oh, it's like, well, if that was something that Bruce Liu shared as well, my mind's going into thinking, okay, what's like behind that is almost like the art of fighting without fighting in a way, right? So it's almost like, um, it's almost like uh, sometimes the you, you don't need to focus on the outcome in order to produce the results. It's almost like effortless effort, right? You know? In yeah. the sense, using using Lax's terminologies on like, you know, coming out with these funky opposite words and stuff. But um, it, it's like, you know, as soon as the, you know, the, the woodcutter just thought, no, nah, I'm not going to even try. He still managed to achieve his outcome, but it was almost like indirectly and accidentally. But then the deeper moral of the story is that it is possible to do if done by thinking outside of the box almost. You know, so it's quite it's quite multi layered in in um, in that side of it. It's like being your opponent by unexpected surprise. You know, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you're on the right lines. And the thing is, this story was originally told by Bruce Lee to Bob Bremer, and mm-hmm. it was in context of one of the techniques Bruce was actually trying to teach him, mm-hmm. uh, something called the Hammer Principle. Okay. And the Hammer Principle is a technique that Bruce taught to trying to try to eliminate what Bruce called preparation. Preparation is telegraphy. Okay. So if you're about to hit your opponent, you don't want to give your opponent any signals or telegraphy, right? That you're about to hit them so that they can respond and uh, nullify your, your attempt. In fact, Bruce uh, Bruce had this technique, like I mentioned, called the hammer principle, which allows you to create preparation, but then do one of the primary strikes in Jeet Kune Do, known as the straight lead, non-telegraphically. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, it, this story is, is talking about how you drop the axe and then just let the strike shoot out without you thinking about it. Just like the woodcutter on his second attempt to chop the tree down with the axe, the axe just slips out of his hands, okay? And that axe is actually a metaphor for the actual straight lead coming out, okay? So within the hammer principle, right, like I said, the idea is, 
And for the people that are watching this, the idea is you start you start with your hand up and then your hand signifies or represents the ax. The idea is to what's called drop the hammer. And then as you drop the hammer, the strike shoots out. Okay. So there's a bit, bit of misdirection in a way. Not even. Mm-hmm. Well, yes and no. But the idea is about getting rid of the prep. So that actually when you're moving and you're and you're fluid in your motion, that you can just snap. Mm. Yeah. Just do the strike without even without even thinking about it. Now, if I do it direct to the camera, it'll be a bit easier. But let me just move this mic up before I punch it off its stand. And for those who are listening to this, I, I recommend you watch the video as well because this technique is quite cool the way Lax is showing it. Hmm. He's um, just snapping at the screen so you can get an idea of what he was trying to... Hard to explain the words. you got to see it. <laughs> it's very hard to explain without actually having a, a physical tutorial on it. But right there, I'm dropping the hammer and then the then it, the strike shoots out. Could you do it to the side for those who are watching? If you could do it to the side, that would let them see a different angle on it. So it's almost like you're about to drop your hand, but that moment of dropping, you're actually punching. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. And it's it's like the axe on the second attempt. Mm. The axe, you know, the woodcutters throwing the axe to chop the tree. But, you know, maybe he's got slippery hands because he's now worried that he's going to get burned to a cinder by the, the dragon. Yeah, yeah. And and the axe just throws up, okay? Yeah, now, so I was thinking, I was thinking if that was a real-life situation and the axe, the, the, you know, the dragon's there, he would have to either be facing kind of the dragon, almost facing the dragon, or the dragon might be behind him. So you can imagine that if he's picked up the axe, he got over his head. As he's gone over his head, he's dropped it, you know, <laughs> slipped out of his hand going backwards. Right, yeah. or then he's come from the top position, coming forward, and as he's about to come down, he's like slipped out of his hands, like you said, and then gone. So it's quite Te- interesting. Technically, it can be either way. You, know, <laughs> you don't know the the concept uh, or the the premise, uh, the mechanical premise upon which this technique has been taught. But ideally, the dragon is in front of you, right? Mm. Um, so your dragon is representative of your opponent. Yeah. Okay. Right, and the whole idea is is to get rid of preparation. And the thing about, the thing in Jeet Kune Do is the straight leads is non-telegraphic. And the idea is non-telegraphic is that when you strike, your opponent shouldn't be able to see it. Mm. So if you are within my striking range, 100% of the time, I will hit you and you won't even know I hit you. Why? Because you can't see it. My hand is quicker than the eye. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's fact. This is not a boast, okay? Uh, and this is based upon the way the mechanics of that strike work, okay? For So for those of you who think that, oh, well, how is that possible? Well, it is possible. There's a whole section on Master Your Life um, called um, uh, Possess an Eagle Eye, which actually explains the science uh, and all the theory behind that. And there's loads of drills on how you can cultivate that. But, you know, it comes through... Uh, cultivating per- your perception, okay, uh, first and foremost, and then cultivate the strike behind that. Because if you don't know how your visual system works and how you can manipulate your opponent's visual system, then how are you going to become so deceptive that they can't see you striking them? And this is the science behind that is based on that. Without going into the technicalities of that, it's really, uh, you know, in a nutshell, exploiting your opponent's um Blind spot, isn't it? Flaws within their visual system. What did you say? Blind spot. Blind spot's one of them, right? Yeah. Blind spot's one of the integral parts of it, but it's understanding the why a blind spot exists, how it exists, and how to exploit the blind spot uh, potentially mm-hmm. uh, to to the point that your opponent doesn't have depth perception. Then on top of that, it's and again, now we're starting to go into the science of it, is to exploit your opponent's ability to actually engage depth perception or for them to go from a activated 
uh, visual system to a deactivated visual system and how you can get them from there to there. So then you can hit them without them seeing it happening. Right. Mm. Uh, and then it's making sure that your strike is done in such a way that it's very stealthy. Okay. Mm-hmm. And there's a whole, uh, there are whole biomechanics around that and how you would, you could you do that effectively so i mean that's the that's the kind of the roots of the story where the where that where that story came from and why bruce was teaching that to bob bremo now bob bremo was just a bit about bob he was one of bruce's big students he was a big guy he was a burly guy uh and he wasn't one of these um kind of fighters that would dance around right and he trained with bruce lee in his la chinatown school with bruce lee for two years um and he did about a thousand hours of private lessons with bruce right wow unheard of lessons he wasn't a sparring partner or anything like that he actually had 1000 hours of private lessons in bruce's backyard okay so he was one of the lucky ones that one was around when bruce was around two was around to learn from bruce directly in his school in his la chinatown school and three had one the the funds and two uh the time um and proximity to be able to train with bruce in privates mm. right in private classes and and when when bruce passed away um bruce's la chinatown um his main confidante and close friend in the la chinatown school who's dan in santo um he started he 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 bruce had asked him to promise him to not teach you kind of openly he was he closed down all the schools and said look you can cle- teach it in a closed group only so he set up what's called a backyard group so he tra- started to teach in his backyard basically i think it was in union city or something like that in la um he started teaching a, in a um in a unit or a garage and then he moved to a moved house and he continued there but for the the first venue you know they the who's who in jit kondo trained in that backyard group and bob was one of them now Mm. now when that closed down after a few years then um uh see for tim tackett were and larry hartsell were the two instructors uh, or two students at that time that were given senior first rank instructorships under Dan Santo, the first two ever people to be given JKD instructorships under the wow. senior first rank. Okay. Larry Hartzell, bless him, passed away. We're lucky that we've still got Sifu Tim Tackett with us. But um, Sifu uh, Tim Tackett, he went and started teaching in his garage every Wednesday night in Redlands, California. And uh, it was about a couple of months down the line, two gentlemen showed up at his garage. One was Bob Bremer, one was Jim Sewell. Jim Sewell trained with Bob uh, with Bruce Lee in his LA Chinatown school for one year, right, mm-hmm. under, under his direct instruction. So Bob Bremer, Jim Sewell, and Tim Tackett became uh, the trio that founded the Wednesday night group. And the Wednesday night group is the biggest and one of the most authentic um, Jeet Kune Do schools in the world. And I'm very fortunate to be an executive advisor to the board uh, as a member of the Wednesday night group board committee. So um, I was invited onto that several years ago and uh, yeah, we you know we do seminars and workshops all over the world. Uh, we've one got one coming up in the states next year, uh, uh, and yeah, we're really looking forward to that. You know, following the pandemic and everything. So that's that's how that's kind of transpired, and this story came out during the Wednesday night group sessions because right. Bob hadn't shared any of this stuff until he got a chance to and he first shared this in the ones in that group and no one had ever seen or heard of this hammer hammer principle and um or heard about this story 
And that's when this story was passed on. And that's how that story's kind of come to me to share with everybody that's listening here or watching. Oh, here. That's so cool. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and I had to, um, with CV Tim's uh, kind permission, actually took that extract and wanted to do a koan around this. And that's why this, for me, has got a direct connection to my senior CV Tim Tackett and, uh, and Bob Bremer and Bruce Lee. So it's a beautiful story but you know as as fables and parables go you know there's always a a deep-rooted meaning behind it but the teaching here was mechanical or physical in nature but it's it's interesting because the whole point about the martial mind power podcast is about taking martial arts and the principles and philosophies within that to enrich your life so you can live the martial way Mm-hmm. Um, and here we have a koan where you started talking about the the impact that this has to that element of it, not knowing that it had a physical element to it and roots in the first place. Yeah, and that's the whole point where you start to bridge the two together, and that's the beauty of it all, right? So in this, in this koan, actually, from a mental, emotional, and spiritual. Uh, aspect what we're talking about is sometimes in order for you to actually do the thing that you want to do you have to be free in your mind and let it happen so that you can do it most effectively because the moment you start to strain or cause tension around that your movement becomes mechanical and robotized yeah but the moment you let go of that then your movement flows. And that's the whole point of the actual physical movement and your mental movement and your spiritual movement is to allow it to be free. You allow it to be free by not even thinking about it. It doesn't mean you don't need to cultivate the techniques. It doesn't mean you don't need to cultivate the processes within your body and your mind. Of course you do. But once they're there, then you've got to become free with it. And to become free with it is practice, practice practice and i like to say perfect practice makes perfect Mm -hmm. imperfect practice creates imperfect movement right whether it's body mind or spirit so perfect practice makes perfect so you must make sure that you practice perfectly in the first place otherwise you're creating bad habits and it takes longer for you to reprogram or undo and then program new correct line motion uh, later and it just takes a lot longer as well so so that's the idea behind that so hopefully uh, you can kind of see the depth within uh, that absolutely i mean that just reminds me it reminds me of a, um, a story of um, uh, um many many years ago when we used to do weight trading and stuff we were in my friend's garage and uh, he's on the bench press right and he's lifting the the weights and we're talking, having conversations with him. And during the whole kind of conversation, one of his rest points, he was distracted by the conversation we were having. And at the same time, and myself and another friend deliberately put on extra weight on the on the uh, on on the weights, right? On the on the bar. He hadn't noticed, he hadn't seen this. And um <clears throat> when he was taking like a rest moment, and then he went back to it and he just started lifting it like it was nothing. And myself and my friend looked at each other, thinking he hasn't noticed. And he said, what do you mean? He said, we just added like extra weight onto it. And at the moment we said that it dropped, and he said, oh, I can't lift it no more. And we were just mesmerized. Like, how is that possible? Like what actually happened in that moment? And it's a bit like that thing, like you, you let go of that moment, all of a sudden you've yeah. created something that you didn't necessarily know. So it was just reminded me of that thinking that's, that's such a, it, it makes you wonder about the things we're doing in our life where we've created parameters and limitations. Yeah. right on what we think is possible and Absolutely. the moment we remove those we could kill dragons <laughs> slay slay the dragons and you know on top of, on top of that you know one of one of my favorite favorite quotes which is uh you know uh, highly recognizable because it's associated with a very famous brand is just do it mm. right just do it right Stop thinking about it. Just do it. And, you know, we all know that that's Nike, right? And this, the story behind that is quite an interesting one because the head of marketing at the time was trying to create a um, 
a whole new marketing campaign and he wanted a whole new uh, strap line, you know, a whole new catchphrase to go with it. And um, his marketing team were annoying him, right, to put it to put it mildly. And um, he just turned around and said uh, in a very angered voice, do it. Mm. That was it. And they're like, ah, oh, hold on a minute. You've just freaking nailed it, right? Yeah. That's the whole point, isn't it? Even with sports, just do it. Just go out there and do it. Don't think about it because that's when you start to make up excuses for not doing whatever you want to do. If you want to go out for a run, you know, um, you can make a million more excuses not to do it. And the chances are you won't do it then. But you just got to get in your head, just do it. And that's it. Everything else needs to just be parked for the moment. And you just go out there and do what you've got to do. And um, you just got to be free and easy with it and attached to everything, even the outcome in doing that. And then it just comes more freely and naturally. That's right. And do you reckon, Sifu, do you reckon that Bruce Lee had studied magic and mentalism? And the reason I say that, right, is because I was watching an old video of a friend of ours who is very good with magic tricks. And uh, he mesmerizes and everything. And watching back on the video, I figured out how he actually did the stuff. I'm not going to reveal it because I said magicians don't reveal their secrets. But what I am going to say is that he used a lot of misdirection in terms of how he was distracting the audience, how he's using his hands and what he was doing in order to get like, you know, bypass what people were visiting and get the, the job done. And when you were sharing that hammer principle, it was almost like that because the technique's almost like he's about to drop his hand, but he's not dropping that, he's punching, right? So it's almost like, did Bruce Lee look into magic and mentalism? Because part of mentalism is actually misdirection and kind of, you know, putting your opponent off balance, if that makes sense. So as a, as an instructor in Jeet Kune Do, um, um, one thing I would say is, a big part of practicing martial arts to a proficiently and competently is, is about managing your opponent's mind. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that mean? Okay. <clears throat> well, everything that you do happens in the mind, right? Whether you're, you know, eating something and you're tasting it, whether you're, you know, touching something and feeling it and getting a sensation, uh, whether uh, whether you're, you know, in the sun and it's nice and warm like it is in this room today, or whether it's cold, whether you're hearing something or anything, all your senses, right, they're all translated into neurological signals that create meaning in your mind, okay, right? So... In combat, what we're doing is essentially manipulating your opponent so that you create a, what we call a window of opportunity to take advantage, to incapacitate your opponent as quickly as possible to um, take the risk and threat away of getting hurt. Okay. And um, so we do that, you know, using macro movements. We do that using micro movements. And a lot of that, a lot of that movement, even when we sp I spoke about the um, uh, manipulating the visual field and the flaws within our visual field is a means to try and manipulate the mind, right? And the reason why you're manipulating the mind is because I'm doing things specifically so you don't see it, so your mind doesn't register it, mm -hmm. right? So if you want to call that mentalism, go ahead. If you want to call that magic, go ahead. But I tell you what I would call it. I call it hypnosis, okay? Mm -hmm. right? And I tell you why I call it hypnosis is because I want to take my opponent, right, into a state of being that I can control. So I'm going to manipulate that. And I'm going to manipulate that so quickly that they don't even know it's happening. I'm going to manipulate that with different kinds of movement, different kinds of deception, different kinds of tactics and strategies and so on. I must have the tools in my back pocket to be able to do that effectively. But to be able to pull that off is where 
the magic, as you put it, lies. Okay. Mm-hmm. So in fact, actually, it looks like, well, you know, what kind of hold has this person got over me that he's able to hit me and move me around wherever he wants to and like speed me up or slow me down and put me in positions where, you know, I'm disadvantaged. That's the whole point. That's exactly what you're trying to do is you're trying to direct the fight by directing where your opponent goes and what that opponent is doing by manipulating their mind. And you manipulate their mind in so many different ways. The book Master Your Life actually goes into that into a lot of depth. And it talks about uh, various elements around that. Um, And uh, body, mind, emotion, and spirit. And you're working across all of those modalities because they're not separate from you because they're all in you and that they are you. Um, And when you understand that, then you could do that. But here's the thing. Why do I call it self-mastery or the art of self-mastery? The reason for that is if you don't understand that in yourself, you'll never be able to control somebody else with it. If you don't understand that in yourself, you'll never be able to understand that in somebody else. If you don't understand that in yourself, how are you going to be able to implement and execute that real time, right? In a live fight there and then in the moment, because it happens so quickly, right? You can only do that if you've got self-knowledge, self-mastery. So this is why martial arts is all about self-mastery. Now, I know I talked about manipulation of your opponent. Now, here's the thing. I want to make this very clear. I am not condoning you go out there and manipulate other people. That's just wrong, okay? That's absolutely wrong. What I'm saying in combat, if you're threatened by someone that's put you or loved one in harm's way, then you need to use everything that you know, right, in yourself and and what you've cultivated in yourself in order to incapacitate your opponent, okay? That's a different situation. But in daily life, I'm not saying you go out there and start hypnotizing people and start to manipulate people, right, to get your own way, to get them to do things that you want to do. That's just wrong, okay? Uh, But what I am saying is that when you know yourself, you'll be able to understand other people at a deeper level okay because you've got you've got a base point a base reference point bruce called it bruce called it working from the nucleus outwards if you don't know your own nucleus where you are at your core right and then expand from there you will never know anybody else yeah And this is all about self-mastery because self-mastery helps you have a realization about understanding other people right our fellow brothers and sisters, okay, in in this world, okay? Uh, And then eventually it's about when you understand other people, you appreciate other people, you connect to other people, right? And that's where the kindness, compassion, and love comes in. When that kindness, compassion, and love starts to grow, right, infinitely and unconditionally, guess what? You're not operating on a whole new level. You're now not wanting to manipulate people. And actually people are gravitating towards you because they're gravitated to, to, by your magnetism, by your charisma, by your certainty, your surety, your confidence, by your ability to just shine bright. They want a bit of that. They want to understand, hey, how are you doing that? I want to know that. Can you teach me? And that's where the magic happens because they want to be, have part of that. And that helps me, people like me and you light their candle Mm -hmm. because our candles are already lit. And again, in the most humblest way, okay. You can only teach somebody something to somebody if you already got it in the first place. Right. And we're sharing things that we we've got. Okay. Because for us to you know stand and sit here and you know rabbit on about stuff that we don't understand is just inauthentic. Yeah, it's just fraudulent, and I wouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. It's taken many years to get to this point where I felt comfortable that actually, okay, it's time to start sharing, sharing mm-hmm. the things that we know. Because one of the, one of the my famous quotes, if I was to say it that way, and the reason I say it's my famous quote is because it's famous in my own mind to myself is when you've discovered your gift you've got an obligation to give it away. Okay. Mm -hmm. And therefore that's what we're doing. So hopefully that makes sense with the most, you know, uh, uh, utmost humbleness and humility, right. That we share in this. Uh, And hopefully 
the woodcutter and the dragon story now makes even more deeper sense, right? Um, and with that deeper sense, you get a level of orientation for yourself or level of self-reflection for yourself. Where are you in that, right? And coming back to your question, all right, do you think Bruce understood mentalism and magic? I think the way he carried himself, he was doing it anyway. Whether he realized it or not, he was it. Hmm. And I think, I think, I think the world over, people the world over will attest to that. And I, the reason I say that is because still today, people are magnetized by him. Yeah. And he died in 73. The year I was born, he died, right? That's nearly 50 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Nearly 50 years ago, 49 years ago, right? Now, if you think about that, Bruce is still you, right? magnetizing people, right? Yeah. And these are movies that were created in the late 60s, early 70s, right? And he's still got our magnetism a hold over people that watch those movies. Now, if you don't, and I don't that, think there's like any MMA fighter who says they haven't been influenced by Bruce Lee in some way or another, right? Yeah. And if you don't call that magic or if you don't call that mentalism, what do you call it? Mm. I call it magnetism, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just an effect of all of the above, right? Yeah. So therein lies a the beauty. And that's what I'm talking about is when you've got something that is beautiful, that is, you know, um, unconditional and it's shining bright. It will attract people because they're also actually attracted to the light because we all are. We're all part of it. That's why. And actually what it's saying is help me reveal mine. And they might not even know they got it. Mm. We all have it. It's just, exactly. you know, you need to remove the veil. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, you know, you, you just told this story a few times about, you know, when you're in a dark room and uh, all it takes is, you know, one candle to to uh, light up the room. But then when that candle lights up other candles in the room, then that room just gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And that's that's how consciousness spreads. Consciousness mm -hmm. spreads by you lighting other people's candles. You lighting them up. You know, one of the – there's a koan around that. But we'll go into that one another day, right? But um, uh, it starts to help you understand that you have the power to do this. You have the absolute sovereign power within yep. you to do this. Exactly. So, exactly. you know, uh, live it as a sovereign nation unto yourself. That's it. That's it. Yeah, and I just wanted to, like, just share with others as well in the sense that, you know, anything we do in life, there's always that idea of something working and something not working, right? And if you want to achieve something in life, find people who have done it, right? And then model them, right? Just like look for those people. If you want to achieve something in life, look for the people who have done it, study them, read their books, connect with them, get mentoring and coaching from them, get into the same mindset and thought process as they were doing, and there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to replicate those results to some level and some degree. Yeah. So it's there for everyone to tap into and, um, you know, share, share. And that's why I seek out people who have already done it. And that's how you get to a more kind of evolved state, I would say, you know, in, in regards to anything you want to achieve in life. Absolutely. And just to add to that as well, and to support your, your, your wisdom there, JT is when I was a kid, Okay. Uh, at that time, um, um, I kind of like was fascinated by football, you know, how these players were just uh, controlling this ball amazingly just with their feet and, you know, so on. And the, the game was just kind of curious about it as a little kid. And um, as I started to, you know, get into football and I started to learn more about football, I started realizing the teams that play football and some of these teams uh, had some amazing players. So my natural instinct was who's the best player? right? Who's the best player? I didn't ask myself, who's the shittest player? I asked myself, who's the best player? So I started seeking, you know, players that made me feel alive, right? Made me feel excited. And um, um, back in the day, you know, um, it, for me, it was Kevin Keegan, 
right? Kevin Keegan just had this thing about him, right? You know, he had this long permy hair, which was like, you know, kind of really cool back in the day in the uh, late 70s, 80s, early 80s. You know, the guy was phenomenal footballer and um, everyone spoke about him. He played for Liverpool and then followed it when he was superseded by uh, Kenny Dalglish and he was superseded by Ian Rush. And there was like almost a decade of um, where Liverpool were just at the top. And it was um, the excellence there was not just the individuals, which was my main attraction, right? But the overall team, how it just worked together. It was just amazing. Now, when my son, uh, uh, you know, he's he's uh, a teenager, but when he was young and he uh, was getting into football, I said to him, I said, you choose whatever team you want to choose, right? And um, I'm not going to... Uh, sway you or bias you right to choose a team that i chose when i was younger i mean you know in my heart of hearts you know back then it was liverpool but you know the thing is i don't really follow football you know as diligently as I used to um so for those non-liverpool fans out there you know th- this is not about separation the point is about modeling excellence my son went and chose manchester united who back in the 80s were the arch rivals of liverpool and mm. i said what are you? and i said you know obviously <laughs> joked around with him like what are you doing all this kind of stuff but then you know i said to him i said look i get it you got you're going through exactly the same process as i went through back then you need to choose what you need to choose manchester united at that time was the most excellent team right and some of the players that were playing then were the most excellent players at that time uh so he also modeled excellence why because it's an innate human trait right to model excellence right so this is not about football guys for those of you that are thinking oh he's a liverpool fan you know he's an arsehole or whatever right no trust me i'm not even a liverpool fan i'm just a fan of people that are excellent at doing what they're doing. And I want to understand and, you know, cultivate excellence in myself by modeling those people. Exactly what you just said, JT, right? No matter what area of um, your life it is, whether it's learning how to play football and modeling an excellent football player, and I mean the excellent football player, or whether it's uh, or, or the excellent team, or whether it's, you know, cultivating your body, mind, spirit, and your personal development, right? You want to model someone that's that's got it already and they can make it work or whether it's in business or whether it's in your studies, you know, uh, and so on, you know. Uh, so that continues, but you do it unconsciously. You know, if you wanted to, if you was learning physics at A-level, let's just say, you're not going to go get advice from somebody who flunked A-level physics because that's just going to be pointless. You're going to go to somebody that's freaking absolutely aced it and gone on to do physics at a higher level even possibly right because they understand it that's right they get it they know how to make it work and transcend that understanding of that subject matter and become experts in it mm-hmm. right absolutely man so yeah we do that in all aspects of life right but i think you know earlier on i was talking about you know, self mastery, cultivate self mastery, or helps you understand yourself so you can understand others. So you see, once you understand why people choose their, their certain parts or certain ways, actually, what you realize, we're all doing the same thing. We're all doing the same, yeah. We're all operating from the same core, right? It's just our perceptions are slightly different. Therefore, the way we conduct ourselves is just slightly different, and our choices and things that we do, right? And that's that is okay in fact that's what make life colorful because if everyone did the same thing it'd be kind of boring right exactly <laughs> exactly yeah no variety same old stuff over and over again you know it's not it's not gonna do any justice to anyone that way but yeah that's been amazing see um it was it was so interesting like you know when just going from that initial title to imagining this story and then actually hearing the story, you know, and then leading to all all this, leading to excellence at the end of it, really, about, you know, self-mastering and being able to understand yourself so you can understand others and then how to use that in a combat situation as well. It's just been phenomenal, you know. Um, so thank you for sharing your insights on that. Um, and um, 
yeah, I think that's a, a good place to stop until the next one. Unless there's absolutely. anything you wanted to add? No, absolutely, guys. Uh, I mean, I think we've said it all, but, you know, pra- perfect practice makes perfect. And then just go do it, you know, mm-hmm. just like the uh, the woodcut, you know, he's chopping down that tree. Just just let it happen, man. And next thing you know, you know, you, that axe just, you know, let's go by itself and you're free and you've actually done it without realizing you've done it. Mm-hmm. And that's how you get it just by keep going. So um, onwards and upwards, onwards and upwards. There you go, folks. Again, there's the book title for you, The Art of Thinking Without Thinking, available on Amazon. You can go to marshallmindpower.com. Um, any questions, do reach out to us. Do like, comment, share, spread the knowledge, spread the wisdom to anyone. If there's any particular topic you want us to talk about, again, please just share. And on that note, signing out. Thank you very much, Sifu Thank you, everyone. And see you next time. Thank you.